Here is an item of daily use that you often find on your breakfast table. A simple loaf of bread reaches you as a result of several different activities. The story of a loaf of bread begins with a farmer growing wheat in his field. The wheat produced by the farmer is ground and processed into flour at a flour mill. The flour is baked into bread in a bread factory. The bread is transported to shops in different parts of a city and reaches your neighborhood shop from where you can buy it. All these activities that involve the production and distribution of products and services are examples of economic activities. Economic activities are classified into three different groups called the primary sector, the secondary sector and the tertiary sector. Did you know, the three-sector hypothesis that divides the economic activities into primary, secondary and tertiary sectors was developed by Colin Clark, a British economist, and Jean Forasti, a French economist. Activities like agriculture are called primary sector activities. Besides agriculture, Primary sector activities include animal husbandry like dairy farming and poultry farms, fishing, mining and forestry. All primary sector activities use natural resources to produce natural products. Since the largest number of natural products comes from agriculture, the primary sector is also called the agriculture and related sector. Activities that use natural products or other raw material for industrial manufacturing of goods are called secondary sector activities. The secondary sector includes all kinds of manufacturing activities from food processing to manufacturing of automobiles, garments, and electronics. The secondary sector includes all activities involving the manufacturing of goods in small scale or large scale industries. Thus, the secondary sector is also called the industrial sector. Activities that support the manufacturing and distribution of goods produced in the primary and secondary sectors are called tertiary sector activities. Tertiary sector activities include transport and warehousing, retail and wholesale selling, banking and insurance, and communication services. The tertiary sector also includes essential services like education, healthcare, accounting, legal services, law and order, firefighting and office administration. Tertiary sector activities provide various kinds of services including the ones that support the production of goods. Thus, the tertiary sector is also called the services sector. Though the activities of the primary, secondary and tertiary sectors appear quite different, they are interdependent on each other. Let us understand the interdependency of different sectors through the example we used earlier. A failure of wheat crop in the primary sector would affect the production of flour and bread in the secondary sector, leading to reduced supply and availability of bread in the tertiary sector. Similarly, if the transporters go on strike, Unsold stock will pile up with the manufacturers while there will be shortage of goods at the shops. The primary, secondary and tertiary sectors of the economy involve the production of a large number of goods and services. Every product or service has a value and comes at a price. This value is also called the market price of that product or service. 
Now, let us see how the value of production in different sectors is calculated. Consider a car. Manufacturing a car requires using hundreds of metal, glass, plastic and rubber components that may be manufactured by many different industries. However, when you buy a car, you do not pay for its individual components separately. You only pay for the final value of the car that already includes the values of all its components. Therefore, only the final values of goods are used to calculate the production in a sector. Every year, the government collects data on the values of final goods and services produced in different sectors of our economy. The sum of the total production in the three sectors in a year for a country gives the gross domestic product or GDP for that country in that year. We can also say that the gross domestic product is equal to the total value of all final goods and services produced in a country in a year. GDP is a globally accepted indicator of the size and health of a country's economy. Let us now see how much different sectors contribute to the GDP of a country. Statistical data reveals that the contribution of different sectors to the GDP of a country depends on the state of development of that country's economy. An economy starts developing based on natural resources and products. Thus, at the initial stage of development, the primary sector is the biggest contributor to GDP. In a developing economy, industrialization creates fresh job opportunities and people start using more and more manufactured goods. This is the phase where the secondary sector becomes the biggest contributor to GDP. In developed countries, people can afford and demand more and more services, leading to a rapid growth in the tertiary sector. Thus, in developed countries, the tertiary sector is the biggest contributor to the GDP. The graph here shows the change in the contributions of the three sectors to India's GDP from 1973 to 2003. The graph shows that although all the three sectors expanded, the tertiary or services sector recorded the largest growth to become the largest sector in India's economy. This graph shows the change in the percentage contribution of GDP by the three sectors from 1973 to 2003. The graph shows a decline in the contribution to GDP from the primary sector, a marginal increase in the contribution from the secondary sector, and a significant rise from the tertiary sector. Now let us take a look at the reasons for such a rapid expansion of the tertiary sector. The tertiary sector has expanded due to the government's initiatives for the expansion of essential services like schools, hospitals, banks, postal services, police stations, local administration and the army. Another reason for the expansion of the tertiary sector is the development of transport, trading and storage services to support growth in agriculture and industries. Rising incomes of people and a growing demand for better services like private schools and hospitals and leisure services like dining, hotels, shopping and tourism have also contributed to the growth of the tertiary sector. The tertiary sector has also benefited from the rapid development and expansion of communication and information services over the past decade. We have seen that in the three decades from 1973 to 2003, the tertiary sector expanded the most and became the largest contributor to India's GDP. However, the primary sector is the largest employer with more than 50% of the working population engaged in it. As shown by the graph here, the increase in production in manufacturing and services 
is not matched by an increase in employment opportunities in these sectors. The primary sector employs over 50% of the working population, but has a share of only 25% in the GDP, which indicates its low productivity. The reason productivity appears low in the primary sector is that more people than required are engaged in agriculture. Though with more workers the labor effort gets divided, removing a few workers does not affect agricultural production. Thus, some agricultural workers only appear to be employed. This is called underemployment or disguised unemployment. Given an opportunity, the surplus workers could be employed at some place else, where they could work to their full capacity and increase their family's income. Many workers in the manufacturing and services sectors also do not find regular work and suffer from underemployment. Thus, there is a pressing need to create more employment opportunities to increase the productivity of our workforce. This brings us to the question, how can we create more employment opportunities? Building dams, roads and irrigation canals to improve rural infrastructure can generate a lot of employment for local people. Providing easy, affordable loans to farmers to increase production also helps in reducing underemployment in the primary sector. Promoting agro-based industries like crushers, grain polishing mills and cold storage facilities also generates more employment in rural areas. Expanding education and healthcare services will not only improve the literacy and health status of the population, but also create thousands of job opportunities. Promoting the tourism sector can result in the creation of around 35 lakh more jobs. Proper implementation of employment generation schemes launched by the government is also required to provide more employment to people. The National Rural Employment Guarantee Act is one such scheme launched by the central government in 2005. NREGA guarantees 100 days of employment per year to every person willing to work or an unemployment allowance if work is not provided. You have already studied about the classification of economic activities into primary, secondary and tertiary sectors depending on their nature. Economic activities can also be classified into organized and unorganized sectors depending on their conditions of employment. Meet Manav and Rhea. Let us understand the difference in the organized and unorganized sectors by looking at their working conditions. Rhea works in an office where she reports for work at 9 a.m. and leaves for home at 5 p.m. If Rhea is required to work for more hours, she is paid overtime money. Rhea gets paid casual and medical leave besides an off on all Sundays and public holidays. On joining work, Rhea was given an appointment letter stating the terms and conditions of her work. Rhea always gets her salary on time every month. Rhea is entitled to all the allowances as per government rules like provident fund, medical allowance, travel allowance, etc. Rhea works in the organized sector with regular terms of employment as per government rules and guidelines. Manav works as a daily wage laborer at a construction site and reports for work at 8 a.m. Manav is supposed to work till 5 p.m. 
but often works till much later. He gets no overtime for the extra hours of work. Manav does not get paid leave even in sickness and works on all days including public holidays. Manav was not given any letter of appointment and can be removed from work any day. Manav is not entitled to any allowances or benefits other than his salary which itself is also often not paid on time. Manav works in the unorganized sector where government rules and guidelines for employment are not followed. Here is a comparison between the working conditions in the organized and unorganized sectors. When the organized sector offers better employment conditions, why do people work in the unorganized sector? Let's find out. The organized sector offers fewer employment opportunities than the unorganized sector. Some companies from the organized sector operate in the unorganized sector to save taxes and to avoid giving the employees their due benefits. Since the 1990s, a lot of people employed in the organized sector have lost their jobs and or forced to take up employment in the unorganized sector. Let us now look at the groups of people who need protection in the unorganized sector. The vulnerable groups that need protection in the unorganized sector in rural India are landless farm laborers, small and marginal farmers, and traditional artisans like weavers and potters. Workers in the rural unorganized sector can be supported by the timely delivery of seeds and other agricultural inputs, affordable loans, and expansion of storage and marketing facilities for crops. The vulnerable groups in urban areas include casual laborers, street vendors, rag pickers, and people employed in small-scale industries. Workers in the unorganized sector in urban areas can be supported by government assistance to small-scale industries and by finding ways to protect the large number of casual workers. People from the scheduled castes and tribes need extra protection as they also face social discrimination besides the other disadvantages of the unorganized sector. You have already studied about the classification of economic activities into primary, secondary and tertiary sectors and organized and unorganized sectors. Economic activities can be classified in yet another way into public and private sectors. Every economic activity has an owner. The owner owns the company's assets and is responsible for running the business. An economic activity owned and managed by the government is called a public sector activity. An economic activity owned and managed by an individual or a group of individuals is called a private sector. There are over 200 public sector companies or undertakings in India which include the Indian Railways, Air India and many others whose services we use every day like the post office. And here are a few of the thousands of private sector companies operating in India. The main objective of private sector activities is to make a profit. On the other hand, the motive of public sector activities is to make a profit and also provide essential services. Let us see what services are provided by the government through the public sector. The services that the government provides through public sector activities include basic essential services like education and health care, expensive large-scale infrastructure development services like building roads, 
airports, harbors, railways, power plants and dams and providing support services at less than their production cost to support industry, agriculture and social welfare. However, why does the government provide all these services and not the private sector? Even after 60 years of independence, illiteracy, malnutrition and high infant mortality are serious problems in India. It is the primary responsibility of the government to provide basic essential services like education, healthcare, housing, food and nutrition and safe drinking water to all the people. A country needs transport and communication networks and facilities for power generation, trade and commerce, etc. for economic development. Many such infrastructure development services are too expensive for the private sector to provide at a reasonable cost to the average consumer. Hence, such services are provided by the public sector. Private sector companies sell their products at a price higher than the production cost to make a profit and stay in business. However, the government bears a part of the cost for some commodities to make them available at a reduced price to some sections of society. Such support activities include providing power at subsidized rates to farmers and small industries and providing food grains through the PDS to consumers at a price lower than the procurement price paid to farmers.